Hello, my name's Catherine and I work as a statistician. That means that I use numbers and data to try and answer important questions. I'm what's known as environmental statistician, which means that I'm trying to answer questions that will help us understand and look after the plants, animals and natural world around us. In this video, I'll share with you what I do in my job, which is all about answering the question, when we build wind farms, what happens to the wildlife? Across the world, countries are racing to generate more of their energy from renewable sources, from things like wind, solar and hydropower. By using more energy from renewables, we use less fossil fuels, so we use less coal, oil and gas. By burning less fossil fuels, we decrease the amount of air pollution that we make and help to combat climate change. Over the past few decades, we've seen lots of wind farms popping up across the UK, and you might have seen them near where you live. But as well as building wind farms on land, we can now build them out at sea and on our coasts, like this one you see behind me here. You can use this one to help you a little bit, but do you know how tall the wind turbines we build out at sea are? Are they A, 50 metres tall, about the height of 11 double-decker buses stacked on top of each other, B, 100 metres tall, about the height of 22 double-decker buses, or C, 200 metres tall, about the height of 44 double-decker buses. Pause the video to have a think and try and have a guess at the answer. If you said C, 200 metres, well done, you're right. The wind turbines we build out at C are huge, about 200 metres tall. This is about twice the height of the ones we build on land. Because the wind turbines are so big, they take up a lot of space when they are built in our seas. And of course, our seas are not empty, they are home to all sorts of wildlife. Here in the UK, we're lucky enough to have different types of seabirds, seal, whale, dolphin, as well as all the fish, lobsters, crabs and jellyfish and everything else that all these animals eat. Now, here we could have a bit of a problem, because we know we want to build more wind farms to make more renewable energy and help to combat climate change. But on the other hand, we also want to look after our environment and the wildlife that lives in our seas and oceans. Many of these animals will have spent their entire lives living in this one place and will probably not have seen wind turbines before. So we don't know how they will react and we don't know how building the wind farm might change their ability to find food and stay healthy. And this is where maths comes in. We can use maths to work out where animals are and how many there are. If you wanted to know how many people were in the UK, you would be able to do it almost exactly. The government does this by doing a census, which lets them count exactly how many people there are in the country at a particular time. Our oceans are too big and too deep for us to do a census of our wildlife. So we have to use maths to come up with an estimate or our best guess, using the information we have, of how many animals there are. Imagine we had this area of sea here, and I divide it up into 20 squares, all of the same size. We might only have time and money to get boats, people, equipment and divers to count the number of animals in 10 of these squares. If we visited 10 squares and saw 10 dolphins, one in each square, we might then guess that we would also see 10 dolphins across the other squares, one in each square. This would make our total estimate of dolphins 20 for the whole area, even though we only looked at half of it. We can do more complicated things than this too. In our 10 squares we visit, maybe we notice that we only see a seal when the water is very cold, because they find lots of fish to eat in cold water. If we know that there are other squares that also have cold water, we can guess that there might be a seal in those squares too, even though we didn't have time to check. By using the data and information that we have to figure out what habitats these animals like, we can then estimate where else they might like to be, and therefore how many there are in total. If we can use maths 
to work out how many animals there are and where they're likely to be. This gives us a really useful tool for looking after our environment. We can use this information to build wind farms in places where we think there are less animals. This means that even if there are bad sides to building the wind farm, the number of animals that are nearby is small. We can also use this information to keep track of how local wildlife populations are doing so that we can spot any changes or signs of problems early. By using maths, we're able to balance renewable energy and our environment and make decisions that are good for both our planet and for our local wildlife. Now I've mentioned that putting a wind farm out in our ocean might change things for the wildlife that lives there. But what do I mean by that? If you've ever been near a building site or had someone at home doing DIY, you'll probably know that all the hammering and drilling makes a lot of noise. This is exactly what we are doing when we build a wind farm out at sea, except that most of the noise is underwater as the bottom of the wind turbine is hammered into the sea floor. This sound then moves out away from the wind farm and will be heard by animals that are also underwater nearby. These sounds might be a problem for wildlife because they might damage the animal's hearing if they're too close. They might confuse or frighten the animal when they're trying to get food, or they might scare the animal away from somewhere it wants to be. In my work, I've used maths to calculate changes in where seals were before and during the noisy construction of a wind farm at sea. During the construction, I found that there was a 50% decrease in the number of seals that were 20 kilometers away from the wind farm. That means that half of the seals that were there before construction were lo no longer there. When I looked even closer to the wind farm at 10 kilometers, the decrease in the number of seals was even bigger at 70%. However, further away from the wind farm, at 30 kilometers, there was no difference in the number of seals that were there before and during wind farm construction. By using maths, we're able to start to understand how wind farms might change what wildlife does. Another thing we change when we build a wind farm is that we're putting these tall turbines in the environment, in a space where there was nothing there before. Each turbine also has a set of spinning blades on top, which can reach speeds of up to 100 miles per hour in strong wind. This is faster than you're even allowed to drive on any roads in the UK. So, for birds that often fly at these heights, this puts them in danger of possibly colliding or crashing into these moving blades as they fly past the wind farm. Now, I'm going to ask you to have a think for a second and see if you can think of what might cause there to be more or less collisions between birds and wind turbines. Pause the video for a second and have a think. Did you manage to think of anything? Don't worry if not, it's quite a hard question, but there are lots of things that might increase or decrease the number of birds that crash into turbines. Here are a few answers that you might have said. The first is speed. The speed that the bird's flying and the speed of the turbine blades spinning. This is important for working out how easy it is for the bird to avoid the moving turbine. The number of birds nearby might be important. If it's a quiet area for birds, there probably won't be many collisions, but if it's busy, there might be lots. The height of the turbine and the size of the turbine are probably important too. If the turbine is at the same height that birds fly, then the number of collisions will be more than if the turbine is lower or higher. A bigger turbine will also have more collisions than a smaller turbine, because birds can avoid small turbines a lot easier. Whether it's day or night might also be important. Collisions might be more likely at night when turbines are harder to see or if birds are attracted to lights on the wind farm. There are lots more possible answers, but well done if you thought of any of those or anything else that might be important. By using maths, we're able to add all these different factors together to work out how likely a collision between a bird and a wind turbine might be. I've talked about two possibly bad things that might happen to wildlife at a wind farm when it's built. But not all the changes that are caused by a wind farm will be bad. 
Once the wind farm is built, it will be in the ocean for 20 to 30 years. And the bottom tower is a new hard surface that stays still. Over time, small plants and animals like seaweed, barnacles and mussels can start to grow on this bottom bit of the wind farm. As this grows bigger, fish can come in to feed and hide in the new habitat and bigger predators like seals can then come in to feed on the fish. This is what we call an artificial reef, as it's like a coral reef where different animals group together around a solid object that provides a safe place for all the plants and animals to live. So, trying to understand what happens to wildlife when we build wind farms can be quite complicated, but having maths helps us to make sense of the changes that we see and calculate numbers that we can then use to help us make decisions about when and where to build wind farms in our oceans. So, how do we decide if we should build a wind farm somewhere? Well, we need maths again to weigh up the different options and help us make a choice. I'm here on the east coast of Fife, where wind farming is being built right now, about 15 kilometres behind me out at sea. To get to this stage where the wind farm is in construction, it takes many years of planning and gathering information about the place where the wind farm is going to be built. The company that wants to build the wind farm first needs to check that the environment will be a good place to generate wind energy. They need to calculate wind speeds in that area, because if they are too small, it won't be a great place to make wind energy. They also need to calculate water depth, because if the water is too deep, the wind turbine won't reach the bottom, or be at the right height. For every wind farm, we then also need to do something called an environmental impact assessment. This involves us adding up all the possible risks or worries we have about the wind farm, like those numbers I showed you for seals earlier. If, when we add those risks up, the number is low and we think that the wind farm will probably have a small change on the environment and our wildlife, the wind farm construction will go ahead. If, when we add them up, the number is too high, then we need to go back and think if we still want to build a wind farm in that place. We also need to remember that our season wildlife may change as a result of climate change. And so we also need to balance any changes that we cause by building wind farms right now with any other changes that may happen if we don't switch to renewable energy at all. Thanks for watching.